Welcome to my lecture on discrete differential geometry. Our topic is discrete curvatures. Curvature is an important notion in differential geometry. There are many results on curvatures, on their properties, on their behavior in differential geometry. There is also not just a single notion of curvature, there are several notions of curvature and we are going to discretize these notions of curvature, or better, we are going to discretize their properties. Discretizing different properties might lead to different notions of discrete curvatures. Or they might even be the same. Which properties we are going to discretize depends on the goal of our discretizations. Is it theory? Is it applications? Is it something else? Let me start with a quick overview of this lecture. Our goal is to obtain discrete notions of curvature. An important machinery in this theory is Steiner's formula. Steiner's formula measures the area of an offset surface or the volume between a surface and its offset surface. In this formula there appears the Gaussian curvature and the mean curvature. And we are going to discretize this formula and in this discrete version of this formula we can read off discrete notions of curvature, a discrete Gaussian curvature and a discrete mean curvature. And if we discretize this formula in different ways, we will obtain different notions of curvature. And at the end of the lecture we will also have a look at other discrete curvature notions, at curvature notions that appear in other different discrete settings. So let us start with Steiner's formula. Steiner's formula measures the volume between a surface and its offset surface. To understand Steiner's formula, we need to understand different curvature notions of a smooth surface. So let us start with the normal curvature. We are given a smooth surface. And on this surface, a surface point, and through this point, a surface normal n. Then we consider a plane passing through this surface normal and this plane intersects the surface along a curve. And there is a best approximating circle that approximates this intersection curve. This circle has some radius r and 1 divided by this radius r is the normal curvature. If the radius is big, then the normal curvature is small. If the radius is small, then the normal curvature is big. This procedure can of course be repeated. For example, we can rotate the plane around the normal by an angle of theta. This will give us a different plane and therefore a different intersection curve and therefore a different normal curvature. So let us draw a curvature diagram where we mark the normal curvature in y direction. As we rotate the plane by 180 degrees or pi, we must end up at the same normal curvature as where we started. But in between, the normal curvature generates a curve. It can be shown that this curve has exactly one maximum and one minimum in general. And the angle difference between the maximum and the minimum is precisely 90 degrees or pi over 2. And we call this maximum and minimum kappa 1 and kappa 2. We also call them principal curvatures. Principal curvature is an important notion in surface theory. As we have seen, the principal curvatures are obtained as the maximum and the minimum of the normal curvature. And they are related to directions in the tangent plane of the surface. The corresponding tangent directions of this maximum and minimal normal curvature are called the principal directions. And as we have seen, those principal directions enclose an angle of 90 degrees. Now, if we have a curve where each tangent direction along this curve is a principal direction, we call this curve a curvature line. And there is a theorem that says that 
Every surface can be locally parameterized by principal curvature lines, apart from so-called umbilical points. Another important notion in curvature theory is the Gauss map. So suppose we are given a surface parametrization f from R2 to R3, or it would suffice if R2 is replaced by some open subset of R2. We consider the partial derivatives fu and fv, and the Gauss map is then the normalized cross product of fu times fv. So n can be seen as a parametrization of some batch of the unit sphere. What we can immediately see here is an intuitive notion of curvature. If you compare the two images, if the surface F is curved quite a lot, then the patch on the Gaussian image on the unit sphere is quite big. If the surface in space would not curve a lot, then the related uh, surface area on the unit sphere would be rather small. So there is a natural relation between the surface area of n on the unit sphere and how the surface curves in space. There is a relation between the principal curvatures and tangent vectors. This relation is called Rodriguez formula. But this Rodriguez formula does not work for any arbitrary surface parametrization f but only for principal parametrizations. But we have seen two slides before that any surface can at least locally parametrized as principal uh, parametrization anyway. So what does it say? Let f be a principal parametrization, then the first principal curvature is the ratio of the partial derivative of n by u and the partial derivative of f by u. And the same for v. We will need Rodriguez formula later. So far we have seen the normal curvature and the principal curvature. But the curvature notions that are commonly identified with surface curvature are the Gaussian curvature and the mean curvature. Those curvatures can be easily expressed in terms of the principal curvatures. Namely, the Gaussian curvature is just the product of kappa 1 and kappa 2. And the mean curvature is the arithmetic mean of kappa 1 and kappa 2. The Gaussian curvature has some interesting geometric properties. For example, the Gaussian curvature is zero everywhere if the surface is developable. That means if the surface can be unfolded into the plane without stretching. Another interesting property is that the Gaussian curvature only depends on the metric of the surface. That is, the Gaussian curvature does not change if we isometrically deform the surface. The mean curvature has also some interesting properties. Some of them are related to physics. For example, suppose you are given a cable in form of a closed space curve. Put this cable into some subfilm liquid and then pull it out again. The surface that is spent in between the cable is a so-called minimal surface. This is the subfilm surface that tries to minimize the surface area. This minimal surface is geometrically characterized by the mean curvature being zero everywhere. So vanishing mean curvature is a physical model of a subfilm. This is a discrete model of a soap film. This discrete soap film spans the boundary of a box and assumes the shape of a minimal surface. Now, as we increase the pressure of the air inside the box, the surface becomes more bubbly. And this bubbly surface is also characterized by the mean curvature. It is characterized by the mean curvature being constant. This is a so-called constant mean curvature surface. We deviated a bit from our goal, which is understanding Steiner's formula better. 
Let's recall Steiner's formula measures the volume between a surface and its offset surface. Well, let's define what an offset surface is. If f is a surface parametrization, then just simply adding a constant times the normal vector n to each surface point gives us the offset surface. This is an offset surface at dist distance delta and is sometimes called parallel surface. Finally, we are in the shape to compute Steiner's formula. For that, we consider a surface parameterization f of some open domain u into R3. We can assume without loss of generality that f is a principal parameterization, as we have seen uh, some slides before. Then the offset surface is denoted by f delta, where delta is some real number. And what we have said before, Steiner's formula measures the volume between a surface f and its offset surface. We call the volume v delta. v delta is a triple integral of the volume form. It is the determinant of f t differentiated by u, f t differentiated by v, and f t differentiated by t. Let us compute the volume between f and f delta step by step. f t is the offset surface at distance t, so it is f plus t times n. Differentiating that by u is f u plus t times n u. We replace that and the same for v. And differentiating that offset surface by t is just the normal vector n. We replace these three terms and obtain a new version which is pulled apart. We collect the coefficients of t, t squared and where no t appears. In the coefficient of t we see nv. Let's recall Rodriguez formula. nv is kappa 2 times fv, so we can replace that. And we do the same for nu and we do the same at the t square term. In the linear term, in the coefficients of t, we now have two times the same determinant, plus one of them is multiplied with kappa 2, one of them is multiplied with kappa 1, so we have kappa 1 plus kappa 2 uh, times the determinant f u, f v and n. Kappa 1 plus kappa 2 is the mean curvature, or twice the mean curvature. So we have two times the mean curvature here. And in the third term of t squared, we have kappa 1 times kappa 2. And the product of the principal curvatures is the Gaussian curvature. And we integrate uh, by dt, which gives us these deltas. We have a delta uh, where there was no t, and we have a delta squared half uh, where there was the t, and we have the delta to the power of 3 divided by 3 where there was the t squared. So we end up with this formula. We just simply um, denote it a little shorter uh, by the area form. The first term is just the area, so we have delta times the area of the original surface f. In the second term we have delta squared times uh, the integral the, the surface integral of the mean curvature and then we have the um, third term which is delta to the power of 3 divided by 3 of the surface uh, integral of the Gaussian curvature. And that is the famous Steiner's formula. Let's have a closer look at this formula. We measure the volume between f and f delta, between f and its offset surface. But on the right hand side we see deltas of course, but on the other hand in the first term we have the surface area which is the surface area of f and not of its offset surface. Then in the second term we have delta squared times the surface integral of the mean curvature of f. This is the mean curvature of f and not of its offset surface. And the third term is delta to the power of 3 divided by 3 
uh, times the surface integral of the Gaussian curvature. But this again is the Gaussian curvature of the surface F and not of its offset surface. So on the right hand side we have basically just information of F, curvature information of F and not of the offset. And still multiplying these three terms with delta delta squared and delta to the power of three gives us the volume of uh, between f and f delta. I think this is quite surprising, at least for me. What we did so far is we have been looking at the smooth theory. We have been looking at the smooth Steiner's formula. What we are going to do next is we discretize Steiner's formula. But it is not so clear which path of discretization to choose. We will later see a different discretization than we are going to consider right now. So what we are doing next is we will be looking at a discretization in the setting of triangle meshes. Triangle meshes are well known in geometry processing. A triangle mesh can be generated, for example, by assembling a smooth surface. And then at the end we will be able to compute curvatures or to come up with discrete curvature notions for triangle meshes. So let us start with triangle meshes. We are interested in discretizing Steiner's formula and an important ingredient in Steiner's formula is the notion of an offset surface. But what is an offset surface of a triangle mesh or what is a good offset surface of a triangle mesh? Before we answer that, let us consider a much simpler situation. Let us consider a planar uh, polygon. What is an offset of a planar polygon? Well, we could just take each edge and offset each edge by a constant distance delta. And then we just simply intersect the offsetted edges and we get a new polygon, a new planar polygon that can be considered a discrete offset. Of this polygon. But this simple idea does not carry over to the situation of triangle meshes. Suppose we have a vertex with only three faces around the vertex. Well, we could just do the same. We could offset each face at the same distance delta. Then we get three offsetted faces that lie in offsetted planes. We intersect those planes and we get a new vertex and offset. But what happens if there are more than three faces around a vertex, which is the general case because a triangle mesh usually has six faces around each vertex. If there are more than three faces around a the vertex, then the offsetted, vertice, the offsetted faces will not intersect in a single point. The intersection is rather complicated. So we do not get an offset mesh. This simple idea does not carry over. But what about the Minkowski sum? We just simply add to each point of the polygon a ball with radius delta. This way we get an offset. But this offset is not a polygon anymore. It consists of edges but also of circular arcs. But this idea carries over to the setting of a triangle mesh quite well. A triangle mesh consists of vertices V, edges E and faces F. Now adding a ball with radius delta to each point of the triangle mesh gives an offset surface. That again is not a mesh, but some kind of surface that consists of faces. It also consists of cylinders and of spheres or parts of spheres. The faces get offset to faces. The edges get offset to, to parts of a circular cylinder. And the vertices get offset to parts of a sphere, to a spherical cap. For Steiner's formula, we have to measure the volume between a triangle mesh and its offset. This volume consists of three types of volumes. There is the volume between two faces, two corresponding faces. Then there is the volume between an edge and its offset cylinder. And there is the volume between a vertex and its offset sphere. 
The volume between two corresponding faces is just a prism. The volume between an edge and its offset cylinder is a sector of a circular cylinder. And the volume between the vertex and the sphere is a sector of a sphere. So let's compute these three types of volumes. Volume F is simple. It is just a prism and the volume of a prism is area times height. The height is the, the offset distance, it's delta. So area of F of the face times delta is the volume of this prism. The volume corresponding to an edge is the volume of a sector of a cylinder. The cylinder itself has volume delta squared times pi times the length of the edge, which is the height of the cylinder. And from this cylinder we just take some part. This part is alpha e divided by 2p, where alpha is just the angle uh, of the sector, or the same is the angle of the two normal vectors of the two faces. But the volume corresponding to a vertex, which is the volume between the vertex and the spherical cap, is much more complicated. We will have an extra look at how to compute that. Before we compute the volume of the spherical sector, let us first compute the area of the spherical cap. We are given a vertex star. And the spherical cap lies on a sphere with a center in the vertex of the vertex star and the radius of the sphere is delta. Now the spherical cap is a spherical polygon. The vertices of the spherical polygon are obtained by taking the normals of the faces put them through the vertex of the vertex star and intersect it with the spheres. This is precisely the spherical cap. Let's assume that the angle between two adjacent edges of the vertex star is alpha i. Then the angle of the between the corresponding uh, edges of the spherical cap is pi minus alpha i. This is best seen in a projection into the face of the vertex star, orthogonal projection. So we project in the direction of the normal of the face. In this projection, the edges of the spherical cap, at least the two uh, adjacent edges, degenerate to straight lines. And these straight lines enclose an angle of 90 degrees with the uh, neighboring edges of the vertex star. And therefore it is easily seen that the angle between the two edges of the spherical uh, cap are pi minus alpha i. But what is the surface area of the spherical cap? To compute the surface area we have a look at the famous formula in the Gauss-Bonnet theorem. For this Gauss-Bonnet theorem, we have a surface and a simply connected domain that is bounded by some connected curves. The ingredients of this formula is the surface integral of the Gaussian curvature. Then there is the integral of the geodesic curvature along the boundary curves and then the sum of all of these uh, integrals and the sum of the intersection angles between neighboring boundary curves. And this must equal 2 pi. Now in the special case of a sphere, the integral of the Gaussian curvature of some domain is the area, is the surface area of this domain. So this is exactly the area that we want to compute. Then in our case, the boundary curves are great circles on the sphere. A great circle on the sphere is a geodesic, so the geodesic curvature is zero. So there is no contribution of the second term. And the intersection angle is just the intersection angle. 
So we easily get from this famous gauss bonnet theorem the area of this spherical cap. But we want to know the volume. The volume is just multiplying the area of the spherical cap with delta with the radius to the power of 3, which is delta to the power of 3 divided by 3. So we finally have the volume of the spherical sector. It is delta to the power of 3 divided by 3 times 2 pi minus the sum of adjacent angles in the mesh. Let's put all these three volumes together and we obtain the volume between the triangle mesh and its offset that we obtained as a Minkowski sum. So finally there it is, Steiner's formula, a discrete version of Steiner's formula. If you recall the smooth version of Steiner's formula, we had on the right hand side deltas and all the rest was independent of the offset surface. Here we have a similar situation. We have delta, delta squared, delta to the power of 3, but the rest does not depend on the offset surface. There is the area of the original triangle mesh, there is the angle in between neighboring faces, there is the edge length of the original uh, triangle mesh, and there is uh, the angle between neighboring edges in the triangle mesh. But all these ingredients depend only on the triangle mesh on the given triangle mesh and not on the offset. So let us now compare this discrete version of Steiner's formula to the smooth version of Steiner's formula. There are some similarities. We have delta, delta squares and delta to the power of 3 in both formulas. The first term is area, this is quite comparable. The second term involves a sum in the discrete version and a surface integral in the smooth version and the same in the third term. So what we do now is we compare these two formulas and take that part that corresponds to the mean curvature in the discrete formula and make a definition to define it as a discrete mean curvature. And we do the same for the Gaussian curvature. So what we get is a discrete mean curvature that is defined per edge. This mean curvature can be seen as a concentration of the mean curvature of this discrete surface at an edge. And the same for the Gaussian curvature. This is the famous angle defect formula. And measures how far the surface is away from a planar vertex star. So let us write that down. The mean curvature is defined on edges and it is the angle between the two neighboring faces at this edge times the length of this edge divided by 2. And the Gaussian curvature is defined on vertices and it is 2 pi minus the sum of angles, where the angles are the angles between two neighboring edges emanating from this vertex V. So what we just did is we discretized Steiner's formula in the setting of triangle meshes. We obtained a discrete Gaussian curvature, a discrete mean curvature. The discrete Gaussian curvature is defined at vertices, the discrete mean curvature is defined at edges. We also discovered that it is not so straightforward to come up with an offset notion in the setting of triangle meshes such that the offset surface itself is a triangle mesh. What we did instead is we used Minkowski sum to obtain an offset surface, but the offset surface then is not a triangle mesh again. It is a, a, a surface that is generated by faces, cylinders and spherical caps. What we do next is we discretize in a different setting. We discretize in the setting of polyhedral surfaces. Of course a triangle mesh is a polyhedral surface, but we allow each face to have more than just three vertices or more than just three edges. We allow for quadrilaterals, pentagons, hexagons and so on. At the end we will come up with a new 
notion of curvature, discrete curvature, discrete wind curvature, discrete Gaussian curvature, that are now defined at faces instead of vertices and edges. In our second discretization, we work in the setting of polyhedral surfaces. A polyhedral surface is a mesh with planar faces. It has vertices, edges and faces, but the faces are now restricted to be planar. Of course, a triangle mesh is also a polyhedral surface, but it is a rather special one. In our case, we allow for the faces to have more than three edges or more than three vertices. Our goal is again to come up with a discrete version of Steiner's formula. The most important ingredient in Steiner's formula is the notion of the offset surface. So we are confronted here again with the same question, what is a good offset surface for a polyhedral surface? In the setting of the triangle meshes, we allowed the offset surface to be something else. It was not a mesh anymore because it included cylindrical parts and spherical parts. Here we would like to stick in the, in the class of polyhedral surfaces. So we want the offset surface also to be a polyhedral surface. But how will we define this? Well, in the classical sense, in the classical surface, the offset surface has the property that in corresponding points the tangent planes are parallel to each other. So that's something that we would like to have here as well. Corresponding faces of the mesh and the offset mesh should be parallel. If the faces are parallel, then we immediately get the property that the edges are parallel as well, because parallel faces intersect each other in parallel edges. So what we get is actually a pair of parallel meshes. Let's consider just one polyhedral surface and the set of all polyhedral surfaces that are edgewise parallel. That is, corresponding edges should be parallel to this one given polyhedral surface. This is a set. And this is a special set because this is actually a vector space. A set of all meshes that are parallel to a given mesh form a vector space. For a vector space, we need the notion of adding two objects of the sum and the notion of the multiplication with a scalar. Well, we just simply take adding corresponding vertices. If you have an edge and a parallel edge and you add the vertices of these two edges, you get a new edge, which is also parallel to the original ones. And multiplication the same. Multiplying with a scalar just means you multiply each vertex with the same scalar. With these two operations, with this sum and this scalar multiplication, this set becomes a vector space. This will be important a little later. Now, parallel faces, parallel tension planes does not define an offset surface. We need more. We need that the distance between the two tension planes is uh, constant. In our case, we can decide between three classes. The distance between corresponding vertices should be constant, or the distance between corresponding edges should be constant, or the distance between corresponding faces should be constant. Actually, you could take any other meaningful distance function between the polyhedral surface and its offset surface. But the three that we mention here are the common ones. These are the ones that are heavily used in discrete differential geometry. Now suppose we are given a discrete surface M and an offset surface M delta at some constant offset distance delta. As we've mentioned before, the set of parallel meshes is a vector space. So we can take two of these uh, meshes and subtract them. We do this for m delta minus m. Then we divide by the distance delta 
and we get a, a mesh n. This mesh n also lies in this vector space, of course. So that means that corresponding edges of n are parallel to the corresponding edges of the original mesh m. This discrete net n somehow approximates the unit sphere. Therefore, we will call it a discrete Gauss map. In the illustrated image here, we are working in the setting where the distance between corresponding vertices is constant, is a constant delta. In that case, the Gauss map n is inscribed in a sphere. By that we mean that the vertices of the Gauss map lie on the sphere. But n is also a polyhedral surface, so all the faces are planar. Now if we take such a plane that carries a face and intersect the sphere with that plane, the intersection curve is of course a circle. And this circle carries the four vertices, in that case four, of the face. So what we get is a circular net, that is a, a net where each face has a circumcircle. But not only the Gauss map is a circular net, also the original net is a circular net. Because a quadrilateral has a circumcircle if and only if the sum of opposite angles in the quadrilateral add up to pi. Now if you consider another quadrilateral that is edgewise parallel to this given one, also there the sum of opposite angles add up to pi, of course. So the edgewise parallel quadrilateral is also circular. So all meshes that are edgewise parallel to a circular net must be circular nets. What we just learned is that not every mesh has the so-called vertex offset property. What is the vertex offset property? It means that to a given mesh there exists a parallel mesh with the property that the distance between corresponding vertices is constant. We just learned that in that case each face, at least if it is a quadrilateral, must have a circumcircle. This is a restriction on the mesh, so not every mesh has the vertex offset property. And also in the other two uh, common cases, edge offsets and face offsets, there are restrictions on the mesh. So not every mesh has the so-called edge offset property. If it has the edge offset property, that means that the distance between corresponding edges is constant, then the Gauss map is a so-called Kirby polyhedron. A Kirby polyhedron is a polyhedron where each edge is tangential to the unit sphere. And in the phase offset property, that is where the distance between corresponding phases is constant, this is only possible if the net is a so-called co uh, conical net. A conical net is a net where all the faces around a vertex touch a cone of revolution, as illustrated here. In what follows, we are developing a curvature theory, a discrete curvature theory, again following the idea of Steiner's formula. And there it does not matter in which of these three settings we are working in. We do not even have to work in one of these three settings. We could have any other offset property as well. But the theory that we will develop works for polyhedral surface, it re was recently extended to other types of surfaces, but we will develop it for polyhedral surfaces. Let us first fix some notation. The vertices of M of the original mesh are called Xi, the vertices of the offset mesh are called Xi delta, and the vertices of the Gauss map are called Ni. These three meshes are all edge-wise parallel to each other and face-wise parallel to each other. Since all the faces are planar n-gons, planar polygons, we can compute the surface area of each polygon. We can easily compute it with the so-called Leibniz sector formula. It is 1 over 2 times the sum of the determinant of xi, xi plus 1, 
and the normal vector of the plane, the normalized normal vector of the plane that carries this n gone. In that case, this is the surface area of a phase of mesh M. Again, we are interested in Steiner's formula. For Steiner's formula, we need to compute the volume between the phases of the original mesh and the offset phases. That's what we do here. We compute this volume. We call it Vf because we compute it for each phase separately. It is the integral from zero to delta over the areas of these layers of phases between the original phase and the offset phase. So what we do now is we replace the offset xt by the notions of x and n. So the vertices x i t are simply x i plus t times n i and the same for i plus one. So we get this new formula here. We pull that apart and collect the coefficients of t and t squared and where there is no t. Then we take this formula and copy it to the next slide. And what we do next is we integrate by t, gives this shorter formulation of this formula, but it is also shorter because we made some definition. The notion in the second row, the sum of these determinants, we call them mixed area. It is a symmetric uh, linear form, a mixed area form. And the first term is uh, due to the Leibniz sector formula, just the area of the phase X. And the last term is the area of the Gaussian image phase. So we have an expression for the volume between a phase and its offset phase. Let us now sum up all the volumes for all the phases. What we get is the volume between the original mesh M and its offset mesh M delta. This volume can, or this formula can be seen as a discrete version of Steiner's formula. Here also appears the delta, the delta squared, the delta to the power of three, and then there are some notions, some coefficients. If you compare this formula to the triangle uh, mesh case, you will see that the notions uh, are slightly different. Anyway, we, co we do the same as we did there. We compare this formula to the smooth version of Steiner's formula, where we also see delta, delta squared, delta to the power of three, and then some integrals. And the notions after the integrals and after the sum, we compare them and we use this as a definition. So we define the discrete mean curvature as the mixed area of the phase x and n divided by the area of x. So here is a slight difference to what we did in the triangle uh, mesh case. In the triangle mesh case, we just took this notion and did not divide by the area element. We do this here. In, in the triangle mesh case, we get therefore not exactly the mean curvature and the Gaussian curvature, but we get an integrated mean curvature and an integrated Gaussian curvature. Here we get a discrete version of the mean curvature and a discrete version of the Gauss curvature. The Gaussian curvature is the area of n divided by the area of x. So if you remember uh, the, this image where we were talking about curvature notions of, of surfaces, if the area of the Gauss image is big, then that means that the uh, surface curves a lot. If the area of the Gaussian image is small, then the, er uh, the, the surface does not curve a lot. And this is precisely what we see here. So let us write that down. We are given a, a polyhedral surface M and an offset surface M delta or equivalently a Gauss image N. Then we can compute the discrete mean curvature as the mixed area of x and n divided by the area of x, where x is a phase or a collection of the vertices of a phase on the surface m, and n is the corresponding 
uh, are the corresponding vertices on the Gauss image N. And the same for the discrete Gauss curvature, it is the area of the Gauss image phase divided by the area of the corresponding phase on the surface that we are considering. Let us now consider some examples. As we have talked about before, a minimal surface can be physically generated as a soap film. It is a surface that minimizes the area and is geometrically characterized by the fact that the mean curvature is zero everywhere. So for a discrete minimal surface, we just make the uh, discrete definition that the discrete uh, mean curvature has to vanish. That's a discrete minimal surface. We are here in the setting of hexagonal meshes. Each face is a hexagon, a planar hexagon. So it's a polyhedral surface. We can apply our second discretization to obtain discrete minimal surfaces. A minimal surface, a discrete minimal surface comes with a Gauss image mesh. The Gauss image mesh lies to some extent on the unit sphere. It could uh, approximate the unit sphere by uh, the fact that the vertices lie on the unit sphere or that the tangent planes are, uh, that, that the faces are tangent to the unit sphere or that the edges are tangent to the unit sphere or probably also a different way. In that case, the vertices lie on the unit sphere and the mesh in the center and the mesh on the right forms this pair of parallel meshes where the, surf the helical surface on the right hand side is a minimal surface with respect to this Gaussian image in the center. The image on the left hand side is a stereographic projection of the unit sphere. So if you stereographically project this mesh to the plane, you get this rotational symmetric mesh in the complex plane. And this can be to some extent considered as a holomorphic uh, function, a discrete holomorphic function, because the minimal surfaces, each minimal surface can be represented by the so-called Weierstrass representation over holomorphic data. And there is a relation uh, between this discrete minimal surface on the right hand side and this holomorphic function or holomorphic data in the plane. This is the famous Enipas minimal surface. It is characterized by the fact that the stereo stereographic projection of the Gauss image is the identity. So what would be the identity in a hexagonal mesh setting? Well, we just consider the regul regular uh, hexagonal tessellation of the plane as the identity. And that's what it is here. The Enipa minimal surface has the property that in the smooth case, the parameter lines of the, of the surface in this particular parametrization are planar curves and that's what we also obtain here. The catenoid is another important example of a minimal surface. We obtain a smooth catenoid by taking a catenary curve, which is the graph of the hyperbolic cosine, and rotate it around an appropriate axis. In this image we see a discretization of the catenoid which is a discrete um, surface of revolution and the catenoid is the only uh, non-trivial surface of revolution that is a minimal surface. The discrete mean curvature is zero with respect to an appropriate Gauss image and if we consider a meridian curve which consists of longer segments and shorter segments is in some sense a discrete hyperbolic cosine. It can be shown that it fulfills some interesting properties that characterize the hyperbolic cosine. A particularly interesting surface class, a discrete surface class, are the semi-discrete surfaces. Semi-discrete surfaces are maps from the integers times the real numbers to R3. So actually it is a collection of smooth curves, a discrete collection of smooth curves or a smooth 
family of polygon. The surface class somehow lives in between the smooth theory and the discrete theory because it is not entirely smooth, but it is also not entirely discrete. Uh, but the methods that we use to study these objects are closer to discrete differential geometry than they are to smooth differential geometry. So I would count them more closely to discrete differential geometry. We have curves F and F1 are two neighboring curves. And we have a smooth derivative, partial derivatives of F, partial derivative of F1, and a discrete derivative, which is denoted by delta F, the first forward difference operator. We can do similar things that we did uh, for the polyhedral surfaces to obtain a discrete, or in that case, a semi-discrete, Steiner's formula, and from the semi-discrete Steiner's formula, we can read off a definition for a semi-discrete mean curvature and a semi-discrete Gaussian curvature. I computed the semi-discrete mean curvature and uh, put it here. It includes smooth derivatives and discrete derivatives. And with this mean curvature, we can ask ourselves the same question as we just did for the discrete version namely how do minimal surfaces look like. This is an image of a semi-discrete helicoid. It comes with a Gauss image, of course. And this is not the usual parametrization of a helicoid. How would you gener generically parameterize a helicoid? You would take a straight line and apply a helical motion to it, uh, where the straight line uh, intersects the axis of the helical motion orthogonally. With this uh, motion, you would you could generate a parametrization, but the parametrization would be a so-called asymptotic parametrization. And in the picture that we see here, this is a semi-discrete version of a principal parametrization. So these lines uh, follow the principal directions. This is also a principal parametrization in this semi-discrete setting. What we just saw is a discretization of the Gaussian and the mean curvature in the setting of polyhedral surfaces. We saw a discrete Gaussian curvature and discrete mean curvature that are defined on the faces of a polyhedral surface. And this polyhedral surface comes with a polyhedral Gaussian image. The last two discretizations were discretizations of the Steiner's formula. The next discretization is not a discretization of Steiner's formula, but it takes advantage of a particular parametrization of the surface. In smooth differential geometry, you can simply reparameterize a parametrization of a surface and obtain a new parametrization. In the discrete setting, this does not work so easily. But we can still ask for particular properties that our discrete net, our discrete mesh, should fulfill. And within this particular setting, we might be able to define curvatures. Our next setting is the so-called S-net setting. An S-net is a net that is symmetric to the principal directions. So the parameter lines follow curves that are in each point symmetric to the principal directions. That is what we are going to discretize next. And before we discretize, we have a look at its smooth properties. Let us now switch to a surface class that we call S-nets. We are going to do the same as we did before, namely we start by understanding the smooth setting first and then provide some properties that we are later going to discretize. So what is a smooth S-net? It is a surface parametrization, F, with the property that the partial derivatives Fu and Fv are symmetric with respect to the principal directions. We know that every surface can be parametrized along the principal curvature lines. And in each point, the directions of the principal curvature lines passing through this point are unique, except it would be an umbilical point. Now the partial derivatives, the 
tangent directions of our surface parametrization f are now supposed to be symmetric to these two principal directions. The principal directions are orthogonal to each other. So if fu and fv are symmetric with respect to the first uh, principal direction, then they are automatically symmetric with respect to the second uh, principal direction. These surfaces have interesting properties. S-nets are Möbius invariant. That means if you apply a Möbius transformation to an S-net, you again get an S-net. Möbius transformation is the composition of reflections in spheres and reflections in planes. If you reflect a principal parametrization in a sphere, you again get a principal parametrization of a surface. So being a principal parametrization is not changed by a Möbius transformation. Möbius transformations also do not change the intersection angle of curves. So if you have an S-net, then the parameter lines of this S-net are symmetric to the principal directions. As the principal directions are mapped by Möbius transformation to the principal directions, and since the angle is not changed by Möbius transformation, so is the property of being an S-net not changed. S-nets are preserved under offsets. If you apply an offset to an S-net, then the offsetted uh, parameter lines will form an S-net on the offsetted surface. And these surfaces are characterized by equal normal curvature. So whenever you have a parametrization where the two parameter lines, the, the two families of parameter curves, have the same normal curvature in each point, then this is automatically an S-net. We will need this characterization later. Here we can see two different parametrizations of the same surface. On the left hand side we see a principal parametrization, on the right hand side we see an S-net parametrization. If we look closely to the pumps, a pump is approximately a surface of revolution, so the uh, principal parametrization is rather clear. The one direction is along the meridian curves, the other direction is along the parallel circles. And on the right hand side we see that the S-net uh, crosses these principal directions uh, symmetrically. We are still in the section of the smooth theory. But the objects that we see here are actually discrete meshes. The one on the left hand side is a discrete principal parametrization, the one on the right hand side is a discrete uh, S-net. We put that here for illustrational reasons. And this is actually the procedure how we optimize for our S-nets. On the left hand side we generate with well-known algorithms a discrete principal parametrization and from that one we extract an S-net that serves as an initialization in our algorithm. In this image we see four times the same surface, but it is covered with different S-nets. The image on the left hand side has a constant angle S-net of 30 degrees, the second surface has a constant angle of 90 degrees, and the third one has a constant angle of 60 degrees S-net and the fourth one, the image on uh, the, the surface on the right hand side, has an S-net with varying uh, angles. So let us now compute the principal curvatures of an S-net. Let's look at the bottom to these figures. On the left hand side we see a surface that is parameterized as an S-net, we only see two uh, parameter lines of this S-net. And on the right hand side we see the Gauss image of this surface and the two corresponding curves on the Gauss net. We further see the partial derivative vectors f differentiated by v, f differentiated by u, n differentiated by v, f n differentiated by u. What we do is we take these vectors, normalize them and add and subtract them to obtain eta 1, 2 and e xi 1 and 2. 
And furthermore, we denote the cosine of the angle between the partial derivative of fu and fv by s. So s is the cosine of the angle between the parameter lines of the s-net. Then we define new notions only dependent on this uh, eta and xi. d1 is the determinant of xi1 divided by the uh, norm of xi1 squared and xi2 and n, and d2 is just the same in, uh, but eta instead of xi. And with these uh, two notions and together with s and together with the normal curvature, we obtain the principal curvature of an S-net. So here it is really important that the ingredient is an S-net. F must be an S-net and then we compute the things as described here, like a recipe, and uh, compute these notions and at the end we get kappa 1 and kappa 2. And kappa n in this formula is the normal curvature. The normal curvature of the S-net in the corresponding point. We are still in the section of smooth S-nets, but so far we did not see an example of a smooth S-net. We only saw an example of a discrete S-net, several discrete S-nets actually. But there is a simple way to construct a smooth S-net. For example, take an arbitrary curve, a space curve, it should not lie in a plane, and then rotate it around an axis. This way you get a surface of revolution and the family of curves that you get by rotating covers the surface of revolution. But this is only one family of, of uh, curves that cover this surface of revolution. So just reflect this family of uh, parameter lines in a plane that passes through the axis of revolution. This way you get a second family of curves covering the same surface of revolution. And in each point of the surface, the two families, uh, the two curves that pass through this point, the two curves from the two families, they intersect each other symmetrically with respect to a meridian curve and with respect to a parallel circle. So this way you very easily get an S-net. But, of course, the surface that you generate is uh, just a surface of revolution. Then there is this family of asymptotic nets. An asymptotic net is a net on a negatively curved surface, negative Gaussian curvature, where the parameter lines are the so-called asymptotic lines. The asymptotic lines on any surface on any negatively curved surface uh, are symmetric with respect to the principal direction, so this is definitely an S-net. The third class is take an isothermic net. This is a principal parametrization that is additionally a conformal parametrization. Not, you will not find on any surface such a parametrization. This is a special surface parametrization, isothermic nets. And then you take the diagonal net of this uh, special net, and this one is uh, again an S-net. And then, as we have seen, Möbius transformations do not change the property of being an S-net. So if you apply Möbius transformation to any of the above examples, you will get an S-net. An important ingredient that we will need later in our discretization is the Monnier theorem. Let us start by defining the so-called Monnier sphere. The Monnier sphere is defined for a surface point and a tangent vector. So we are given a surface and we are considering a specific surface point and in this surface point we are considering a tangent vector. And to this tangent vector, we are given a normal curvature. We obtain this normal curvature by intersecting the surface with a plane containing the surface normal and this tangent vector. And the intersection curve has a curvature and this curvature is the normal curvature. So to each tangent vector, we have a normal curvature. 
and the Monier sphere is now defined for this tangent vector and the, its center lies on the surface normal and the radius of the Monier sphere is 1 divided by the corresponding normal curvature. Now the theorem of Monier says that all the oscillating circles of all the surface curves, the curves on the surface, that share the same tangent uh, vector, all these oscillating circles lie on the same sphere, on the Monier sphere. In the image on the right hand side, we see a couple of uh, curvature circles in green. They correspond to these red uh, curves on the surface and all these red curves on the surface share the same tangent vector. So all the corresponding curvature circles or oscillating circles lie on the same sphere, on this Monier sphere. Or we can put it a little differently we obtain the oscillating circle by intersecting the oscillating plane with the Monier sphere. We are now ready to start discretizing the ingredients that we need for this curvature theory for S-nets. We start with discretizing the notion of an oscillating circle. An oscillating circle of a smooth curve can be defined as the limit of the circumcircle of three points where the three points converge to a single point. This is a definition using some, in some sense, a, a limit procedure. We can just simply carry over this definition into the discrete world by saying that a discrete oscillating circle is just the circumcircle of three successive vertices of the discrete polygon. Now we know what a discrete oscillating circle of a discrete curve looks like. But in our case we have a mesh. We are only considering a mesh with the standard lattice set to combinatorics, at least locally. In such a net we have two directions, so we can define two oscillating circles for each direction an oscillating circle. And as we consider one vertex of the uh, mesh and the two oscillating circles, they uniquely define a normal vector, which is just orthogonal to the two circles in this vertex. So we obtain, in a natural way, a discrete normal vector. And the normal vector plus an oscillating circle uniquely defines a Monier sphere, because we know that the Monier sphere carries all oscillating circles. And we know that the Monier sphere is orthogonal to the normal, to the surface normal. So the normal plus the oscillating circle uniquely defines the Monier sphere. And once we know the Monier sphere, we of course also know the normal curvature, because the normal curvature is just simply 1 divided by the radius of the Monier sphere. So the Monier sphere in our discrete setting, therefore, gives us a discrete normal curvature. We have two directions. So we have two Monier spheres and two normal curvatures. But what if the Monier spheres are the same? Then of course the normal curvatures are the same. And if the normal curvatures are the same, then we have an S-net because equal normal curvature characterizes an S-net. So what we finally get is a definition of a discrete S-net. A discrete S-net is a quadrilateral net where at each vertex the vertex star is spherical. This is the Monier sphere. So we have a central point and its four neighbors which are five points. Five points usually do not lie on a sphere. Four points in space usually define a sphere uniquely, uniquely. But these five points, if those define a sphere, we can identify that with the Monier sphere and then the net is an S-net, is if this is true for each vertex star. What are properties of this S-net, of this discrete S-net? Well, it is also Möbius invariant, because a Möbius transformation maps spheres to spheres, circles to circles. But this is all the 
properties that we need to characterize a discrete S-net. We have vertices that lie on a sphere. Möbius transformation will not change that property. So a Möbius transformation will map a discrete S-net to a discrete S-net. And the discrete normal curvatures in both directions are the same, which is a characterization in the smooth um, setting and it is a characterization in our discrete world. Here we see some examples of S-nets. These are typical examples of uh, computer graphics and we applied our algorithm to obtain S-nets, discrete S-nets. Each vertex star is spherical except those vertex stars which are singular vertex stars. For example, if there are five edges getting together, then it is actually not so clear how to define the S-net property there. But everywhere else, the vertex stars are lying on spheres. It could be in the limit that the sphere degenerates to a plane, but in general, this would be a sphere. The object that we can see here is the rendering of a tower. The facade of this tower is a discrete S-net, so each vertex star is spherical, but with the additional property that each face is a planar face. In general, for an S-net, the faces do not have to be planar, but in that special case, also the faces are planar. Such a parametrization has a special name. It is called characteristic conjugate parametrization. This is a discrete characteristic conjugate parametrization. You could imagine that to be a steel glass construction where the faces are made from planar sheets of glass. Now we are going to discretize the principal curvatures in terms of an S-net. We will do this in a straightforward way. Let T1 and T2 denote the tangent vectors of an S-net. These are the tangent vectors of the oscillating circles of an S-net. And let V1 and V2 denote the corresponding tangent vectors of the corresponding Gauss map. We obtain a Gauss map in a natural way because for each S-net in each vertex we have a definition of a normal, it is the line which is orthogonal to both oscillating circles. And with, with these normals we can easily define a discrete Gauss map. And V1 and V2 are then just the tangent vectors of the Gauss map, of the oscillating circles of the Gauss map. The Gauss map itself is also an S-net because all the vertices lie on one sphere, so it is in a trivial way an S-net. Then we just do the same as we did in the smooth setting. We add and subtract the normalized tension vectors. We add and subtract the normalized tension vectors of the Gauss map. And we compute or we denote by S the cosine of the angle of the two tension vectors T1 and T2. Then we again do the same as in the smooth setting. We uh, denote some notions. Um, these determinants by d1 and d2. And then instead of a theorem where we prove that these notions are the principal curvatures, here we use this as a definition. This is our definition that these two notions will be seen as the principal curvatures. Kappa n in these expressions is the normal curvature, the discrete normal curvature, which is just one over the radius of the corresponding Monnier sphere. In an S-net, we have simple access to the intersection angle of the parameter line. The intersection angle of the parameter lines is just the intersection angle uh, between the oscillating circles in each vertex. Now this angle could be orthogonal. If the angle is orthogonal in each point, we call it an orthogonal S-net. And in such an orthogonal S-net, we can prove that the mean curvature is equal to the normal curvature. This theorem also holds true in the smooth setting. If we have a smooth S-net parametrization of a smooth surface, then we can compute the normal curvature corresponding to the two tangent vectors of the S-net parametrization, which is the same. And we can easily show by the so-called Euler's formula that 
uh, this normal curvature is the same as the mean curvature. And in our discrete setting, we can also easily prove that. If you have an orthogonal S net, then this value S, which is the cosine of the uh, angle, of the intersection angle of the uh, oscillating circle, if this is uh, 90 degrees, then S is zero. And if S is zero, then the uh, notions of the first and the second principal curvature simplify to the notions that we have here. So the mean curvature in each vertex is defined to be kappa 1 plus kappa 2 divided by 2, the arithmetic mean of the principal curvatures. And this simplifies um, to the depicted expressions, and that is just simply kappa n. So easy proof that the mean curvature is equal to the normal curvature. So let us consider an example of an orthogonal S-net. In an orthogonal S-net, we have a simple access to the mean curvature. So we are going for a constant mean curvature surface, a CMC surface, that is a surface where the mean curvature is constant along the surface. And um, in this orthogonal S-net, we have the Monier spheres. The Monier sphere radius is 1 divided by the normal curvature. And this is in an orthogonal S-net, 1 divided by the mean curvature. So if the Monier sphere is constant in an orthogonal S-net, then so is the mean curvature. So we are going for an orthogonal S-net with constant Monier sphere radius and obtain a constant mean curvature surface. The image on the left-hand side is a so-called tetranoid. It is parameterized as an S-net, an orthogonal S-net. On the right hand side, we see a minimal surface. The parametrization is an orthogonal S net, but the sphere radius is infinite, so actually the spheres are planes, and therefore it is a minimal surface. Our last discretization was about discretizing principal curvatures in terms of an S net. But an S-net is not only interesting for curvature discretization, but it's also interesting in terms of other aspects of differential geometry or discrete differential geometry. But even more, S-nets are also interesting in terms of applications. For example, an S-net appears in the setting of curvature adaptive CNC milling. Or S-nets appear in the setting of panelization of freeform architectural facades or in the construction of curved support structures for freeform surfaces in architectural geometry. At the end I would like to cite a few references. There are textbooks on discrete differential geometry. The first one is probably the one by Robert Sauer. It is in German, Differenzengeometry. It is the first book that collects the ideas of, different, of discrete differential geometry in a systematic way. Then, of course, there's the book of Alexander Bobenko and Yuri Suris, Discrete Differential Geometry, and the book by Jean-Marie Marvin uh, on generalized curvatures, which is probably the important book here for this lecture. Then for the setting of triangle meshes, I would like to cite Ulrich Pinkel and Konrad Bordier, uh, Computing Discrete Minimal Surfaces and the Conjugates. And again, Jean-Marie Marvin, the generalized curvatures, where they are the ideas that we used uh, in, in the triangle mesh setting. Then for the polyhedral Surfaces section, we have to cite uh, Alexander Popenko and Ulrich Pinkal with their pioneering paper Discrete Isothermic Surfaces. Also Wolfgang Schief contributed very early to this theory and the mesh parallelity, the curvature theory for mesh parallelity uh, can be nicely found also in Alexander Popenko, Helmut Bottmann and Johannes Wallner. And also I myself contributed to this theory a bit and I just want to cite the papers where I took images from. And the last section on S-nets is a quite recent work uh, which can be found in this publication that has been uh, published in 2020 this year. 
At the end I would like to say thanks for watching. I hope I could explain some of the aspects of discrete curvature theory within the framework of discrete differential geometry. And I would like to take this opportunity to say thank you to the organizers for organizing SGP and for giving me the opportunity to present my lecture. So again, thanks for watching and goodbye.